Start recording. Okay, so we are recording right now. All right. So what we'll do today is to talk about comparison. Okay, and this is a really important topic.、Uh, what we talk about today will be on and off, be useful all the way to the end of the semester. So this is one of those things. You know, when you really have to get it down, because you know this is one of the few things that we'll do that we'll need to use all the way until the end of the semester when we actually start to write programs. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to just kind of look into why we only need to determine whether a value is less than another value or not. Because when you think about comparison in C and C plus plus, there are quite a few comparison operators. You have your equal, you have your not equal to, you have your less than, greater than, less than or equal to. Oops, I did not mean to move that little thing here. Okay, let me see if I can move it back a little bit. There you go. So you have great, less than or equal to, and then greater than equal to. So those are the operators, you know, the comparison operators in C plus plus, and also in C, and also in most other programming languages that will let you determine, you know,、um, how one value, typically an integer, a float, or something like that, compared to the other side. So is that okay so far? Okay, you know this should not be, you know this should be pretty familiar to you know the rest of the class or you know, the entire class. So shouldn't say the rest, but everyone should know these. So I'm claiming that we only need less than. Okay, once we have less than, all of the other ones can be defined using just less than and a bunch of boolean operators. So that's the first thing we're going to do. So with less than, okay, if I need to determine what is whether x is less than y, with just less than, it's just that. Okay. No problem. <clears throat> If we have x is greater than y, then all we have to do is to flip the comparison. So now we are determining whether y is less than x. Also, not a problem, right? So let's take a look at x is less than or equal to y. That turns out to be pretty easy to express because you can turn it around and ask: Is it not the case that x is y is greater than x? Okay, so this one takes a little bit of time to kind of let it sink in. Does that make sense to you? If I'm asking, is x less than or equal to y? Is it not the same thing that I'm asking? Is it not the case that y is greater than x? Okay, wait. Okay, I think I might have made a mistake here. Okay, so let me cross on this side because I need I I need less than right. So that would be not y is less than x. Okay, I flip the、uh, comparison operator. <clears throat> so, okay, I corrected my you know statement here. If I want to know whether x is less than or equal to y, isn't that the same thing as asking is it not the case that y is less than x? Are we okay with this one? Now, how do we check whether this is okay or not? We plug in values. Okay, so we'll just say that x is zero, y is one. If x is zero, y is one, then the left hand side is true.、Uh, x is zero, y is one. So the left is going to be false, but the negation of the false is going to be true. So just by plugging in values, I'm fairly sure this is going to work. So the other case I also have to plug in is when they are the same. That's a boundary case. So when x and y are indeed the same thing, they have the same value. Then on the right hand side, y is less than x is going to be false, but the negation of that is going to be true. So I'm fairly convinced that these two are equivalent. Okay, what I'm referring to is the left hand side here versus the right hand side over here. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> So the next one is what about y、uh, x is greater than or equal to y? I mean that's just transposing or reversing the two side. So this is really asking the same thing as whether this particular statement is true or not. So we do okay so far. All right. So now we move on to the equal to versus the not equal to. So now we want to ask, does x and Are x and y are the same thing or not? Only using less than and all the boolean operators. This one looks a little bit funky, so I'm going to leave it alone for now, because the next one is actually easier. 
it doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, if I need to know whether x and y are different, and only using the less than operator, this one turns out to be easier, or at least more intuitive to understand, because all I'm really asking is whether x is less than y or y is less than x. Because if one of these two is true, then x and y are not the same. Is that is that okay? So that means the equal to is just the negation of that. So now I can just put a negation around the entire thing. And we just have to make sure that we do not have at least one of these two being true. So it is not the case that x is less than y or y is less than x. If this negated whole thing is true, then x and y are the same. <clears throat> so are we convinced that with only one single comparison operator, less than, combined with all the Boolean operators, we can replicate all of the other comparison operators that you're familiar with. Yes? Okay. Thumbs up? Okay. All right. So now what do we do is we just need, we're only concerned about x is less than y. And I'm going to go back to the notes here a little bit. You cannot see it yet. Um, actually, it's on this side already. All right, so that kind of addresses your sec section one of why only less than is needed. And now we're moving on to you know, the interpreted values. This we have talked about already, okay? Section two only talks about the VU notation versus the VS notation. One gives you, one gives you the um, unsigned interpreted value of a bit pattern, and the other one gives you the signed interpreted value of a bit pattern. So by this time, because we have already talked about exam one, you know, from 2023, uh, we got two questions. One question you know, uses the VU definition, the other one uses the VS definition. So by this time, I don't think we have to go through section two anymore, because we are already, we should be familiar with both of these definitions already. Is that okay? All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to skip, I will skip section two to get on to section three. So in section three, it talks about when we are using the unsigned interpretation, how do we determine whether a value of a, the value represented by bit pattern is less than the value represented by another bit pattern? That's what we want to find out. <clears throat> so as it turns out, we're going to use a binary subtraction. So binary subtraction is the most basic mechanism in order for us to determine whether a particular value is less than another value or not. So in this case, you know, the first paragraph gives you the answer right away. So if we are dealing with m bit you know, patterns, then t of m being 1 is, is true, okay? t of m being 1 is true if and only if the unsigned interpreted value of the bit pattern x is less than the unsigned interpreted value of y, assuming that t of 0 is a 0. So the only, the only set statement you really need to write down you know, on your, your note here is the first sentence. That's all you need. The rest is a proof. Now, because this is not CISP 440, you do not need to understand the actual proof. But on the other hand, if you have taken 440 already, you might want to go through the proof just to make sure that you still remember what is proved by induction. Um, if you're about to take CISP 440, you can kind of go through it a little bit just to get the hang of it. Like, what does it look like? You know, what does a proof by induction look like? But you don't have to really fully understand you know, what is beyond the first, set, the, the first paragraph. So I'm going to... Let it sink in a little bit here and see if there are questions. Okay, seeing that there are no questions, we will go through a few examples, okay? Because I think the examples will help remind you what is binary subtraction for one thing, and two, it will illustrate this whole concept of, you know, the, the borrow flag, T of M, which is the one that is kind of hanging out all by itself, is the only thing we need to determine whether the unsigned, the unsigned interpreted value of a bit pattern is less than that of another one. All right, so we switch back to the tablet and go through 
you know, an example at this point. So let me go to the tablet right here. <clears throat> so we'll start with um, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 0, 1, 0, 1, and see what the result is. Okay. So by this time, you know, you should be able to look at this and be able to work out the x, y, q, t, and d rows, okay, using the binary definition, because you know, that would be a good exercise. You're going to need that for exam one. Okay, so I will spell out this one. So this way, you know, we can, and we have to assume you know, uh, t of zero is zero in this case. So now we just need to take a look at this x, y, q, t, d. So with the Q row, it is the exclusive OR between the X and the Y. So that means we have a 1 here, a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 0 over here. That's a pretty easy one. So the T row is a little bit different because, you know, for this position here, okay, okay, for this position here, it has to look at the negation of this and this bit over here. So we have not 0 and 1, which is automatically a 1 already. So we have to put a 1 here. And then for this particular bit position, we have to look at the negation of this 1 and this 0. And that conjunction is a 0. Then we also have to look at the negation of this 1 and this 1 over here. But the negation of this 1 is a 0. 0 and 1 is also a 0. So from the xy, we have a 0. From the QT, we also have a 0. So we have 0 or 0, which is a 0. So we put a 0 over here. And then for this particular position, we have to look at the negation of this 0 and this particular 1. So the negation of a 0 is a 1 already. Then we have a 1 and 1, which means we end up with a 1 here already. And then for the last one, now this is important because this is T of M. Because in this case, M is 4. We have four bits you know, in each number that we are subtracting. So this is T of M, and this is the one that can indicate whether the first X is less than Y or not. Okay, This is the one bit that can uh, determine, or not determine, but that can, in that can indicate whether VU of X4 is less than VU of Y4. So now we will figure this out. We have the negation of this 0, which is a 1 ended with this particular zero. So in the end, we still have a one and zero, which is a zero. On the other hand, we have the negation of this zero. The negation of a zero is a one ended with this particular one here. So now we have one and one, which is a one. So now we have a one here. Um, do I have to finish the entire calculation? The answer is no, okay? Because if, if all I really want is to see whether x is less than y, using the unsigned interpretation, this is all I need. Because I have t of 4 already, which is this particular bit here. And the conclusion is, yes, the unsigned interpretation of x is less than the unsigned interpretation of, inter unsigned interpretation of y. So I'm just going to put on the side here, okay, the, without expanding it. But I'm just going to show you, in this case, this is 2. And then V U X, uh, excuse me, Y four. Okay. Where is that? Y of four is five. And to conclude that two is less than five. Okay. All right. Are we okay with this calculation at this point? Now. I'm going to finish up the D row just because later on we'll need that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and finish it. So the D row is the exclusive OR between the Q and the T. So I look at the you know, one exclusive OR with zero. That's a one. One exclusive OR with one. That is a zero. One exclusive OR with zero is a one. Zero exclusive OR with one is also a one. But at this point, okay, that is not needed, okay? You know, if all I want to know is whether x is less than y unsigned, I got my answer already without even the, the D row at all. Okay, so we'll use another example, okay, to show that if the T bit, okay, if T4 is a zero, 
then x is not less than y, okay? And we're going to go for a really trivial example in this case. So we're just going to have 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, okay? So I think in this case, without even knowing a whole lot about what is x, y, q, t, d, <clears throat> most people can just go like, oh, they got, they're all going to be zeros. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're all going to be zeros. So what this means, okay, because t of 4 is a zero here, that means by conclusion is x is not less than y using the unsigned interpretation. Are you convinced that x is not less than y in this case? I mean, if they're the same, they can, you know, one cannot be less than the other one. So this one is kind of clear, but the most important point here is we have a zero here. Um, I will go through yet another example. This one looks kind of, it looks weird, okay? But this one is actually quite important. So this time we have one zero one zero minus zero zero zero, okay? So this is actually a very trivial case as well in binary subtraction. Because, hey, you know, this is just, you know, we just get everything back here because we're subtracting zero. And because, you know, the, because y as a minoan is a subtrahend, excuse me, y is a subtrahend, it is zero, there's no way I need to borrow. Okay? Because, you know, there's no single chance of subtracting a one from a zero because all the subtraction are subtracting zero from something else. So, I can now just go ahead and say, okay, all of these are going to be zeros, and you can already know what D is going to be, because if you subtract zero from something, you get that something back. So it is just natural that D is going to be the same. So in this case, using the borrow bit here, or the T4 in this case, it is also telling us, <clears throat> so this is telling us that uh, VU of X4 is 10 in this case, VUY4 is clearly a zero, and we are basically saying 10 is less than zero. It's false. Well, that seems to make sense. I'm not gonna, I mean, that's, there's no arguing about that. Are we still doing okay so far with these examples? <clears throat> okay, so I think we are fairly convinced that the borrow bit, you know, the T T four in this case, this is T four, this is T four, this is T four. So I think we are fairly convinced that T four itself is enough to tell us whether X is less than Y. If and only if T four is a one, uh, X is less than Y. I mean, somewhat convinced of that conclusion of that statement. Now, as to why that works, okay, um, it has to do with the proof, and once again, give the proof itself, which is basically the rest of section three, starting from here all the way to the end. That is not something that you have to fully understand, and there's no way I'm going to test you know, this portion either. So if you want to skip that portion and go like, okay, this is too much, you know, I just need to focus on what I need to know about this class, that's fine. Ignore that part. On the other hand, if you have the mindset of, okay, but I really want to know why that is the case, then you can try to understand this part. If you do not fully understand it, it's okay, especially if you have not taken CISP 440. If you have taken CISP 440, you should be able to follow the math along, okay? So, but that's totally optional, okay? I wouldn't worry too much if you say, okay, I don't want to deal with it. Okay, don't deal with it. All right, so now we're moving on to section four, which is you know, actually a little bit more complex. So I'm gonna go through this you know, kind of slowly, you know, just statement by statement or paragraph by paragraph. <clears throat> it starts with saying, you know, um, unlike unsigned, where the actual difference of x minus y cannot be its own value, because um, with an unsigned representation, the difference cannot be negative because it is also interpreted unsigned. So that means the only way I can represent a quote-unquote negative value after subtraction is to utilize t of 4 in our example. Okay, that t of 4 means owing for, uh, 14. 
Um, but with signed representation, we can actually represent negative value. So that means if I'm looking at x actually being less than y, so x is less than y if and only if x minus y is less than zero. So, so let's take a look at this particular statement here. Do we have any questions about that? Does that make sense to you? What type of math, you know, ends up with this particular statement? X is less than Y if and only if X minus Y is less than zero. Which branch of math is that? It's certainly not calculus. It's not trade. What is it? Algebra. It's algebra. Very good. Okay. So all we did is to move... Um, all we did is to subtract y from both sides of the original x is less than y. Then we end up with x minus y on one side. And technically, we end up with y minus y on this side here. But y minus y is just 0. So instead of writing y minus y, I just would have put a 0 over there. So then you go like, so how is that significant, right? What is d again? What does d stand for in terms of the rows? D. <laughs> okay, so let, let's go back to the slide. Okay, let's see if we can find out why this row is called the D row. In the subtraction, X is the middle end, Y is called the subtra hand, and D is the difference. That's right. So D is D because it is the difference. Okay, so what does that have anything to do with here? X minus Y is D. That is the difference of a subtraction. Is that okay? In other words, when you look at X minus Y as an expression, you can just go like, oh, so that's our D in a subtraction. Okay? So that means you know, this particular part here is all it is saying is D is less than zero. Are we doing okay? So what is the consequence of D being less than zero? Sorry? You mean a borrow? No, not a borrow. This time we don't have to deal with a borrow. So, okay, so right here it says D is X minus Y, and D is D subscript of M minus 1 being a 1, if and only if V as XM is less than V as of YM. Okay, so let's take a look at that part, okay, because you know, this is the reason why. It works, okay? Why the sign bit is important. So we are taking a look at this one here, okay? And what we'll do is we are going to take a look at the expanded expression of V as D4, okay? So specifically, we're only using four bits in this case. And I'll spell it out, like really spell it out. So we have D0 times 1, because 1 is 2 to the power of 0, plus d1 times 2, plus d2 times 4, minus d3 times 8. So this is after I expand out the entire sigma notation, and knowing that we only have four bits to play with. Do we have any questions about this expansion of v as d4? d being you know, something that has at least four bits. So we go with this one, okay? So let me ask you, how can I make this part of the expression, how can I make this negative? If that part is negative, what do I know for sure? If I just tell you the sum, oh, okay, I just you know, turn the page. <clears throat> so if I were to tell you this particular sum here is negative and <laughs> it still wants to turn the page here because it interprets the swipe action. So if this part is negative, like when they use a mouse pointer this time, so it won't interfere. So if this part here is negative, what do I know for sure? Hmm? Sorry, can I hear you? The sigma is not is zero. No, no, I can make d0 a 1, d1 a 1, d2 a 1, and d3 a 1. Okay? So all the positive, all the non-negative terms, even if every single one of those is activated, the sum of those cannot make up for the, neg for the negative term. Think about this. 
if d0 is a 1, d1 is a 1, d2 is a 1, how, how much do they add up with only this portion of the summation? It's up to, as of only 7, right? If I, if I have d3 being a 1, this will give me a negative subtraction of 8. The 7 is not enough to overcome the subtraction of 8. The whole thing goes negative. It becomes negative 1. And that's the most optimistic situation when you have all the non-negative terms being activated. They're all on. So you can kind of imagine that if at least, you know, if some of the bits, okay, D0, D1, D2, if, if some of the bits are zeros, then it will only go even further into the negative side. Does that make sense? Okay. This is arithmetic, okay? You know, we really should have this down already by this time, okay? So that means this entire thing, this entire uh, expression goes negative as soon as D3 is a 1. I don't care what the other bits are. They would determine how negative we go. But as, if I know that D3 is a 1, I know this entire expression is negative. The only question left is how negative. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And as a result, D3 has a special name. It is called the sine bit. Because when D3 is a 1, if and only if the whole thing is negative. If I only care about whether D is representing a negative value, I only need to know, I need I only need to look at D of 3. So I'll summarize, I'll summarize this statement here. So I would say, you know, in general, d of m minus 1 is a 1 if and only if v as d <clears throat> m is, neg is negative. Okay. So are we connecting, you know, between the first line? Are we making connections between this one here? And this one here. This is a generalized statement where we are not limiting ourselves to only using four bits. This is an example of only using four bits. But do, can we make that jump from a specific case to a general case here? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. So now I will also add one more thing. Okay. So D of M minus one is also, okay. Too lazy to say. Also known as, we'll say AKA um, the sine bit, and we just use S, you know, uppercase S usually to represent the sine bit. That's that's just a definition. Okay, right there is a definition. You know, the most significant bit of an integer is known as the sine bit, because that alone will tell us whether the represented value. Is negative or not? Are we still doing okay so far with all this stuff? Are there any questions? Okay. Seeing no raised hands, you know, I'm going to assume that this is okay so far. All right. So this is great, right? It would appear that the sine bit is going to tell us whether. If the sine bit of the difference, I should be very clear, the sine bit of the difference in the subtraction should be able to tell us whether the middle n, which is x, is less than the subtrahend, which is our y. So we'll go through a few, a few examples to show that it works, but then we also will go through two examples to show that it does not work. Then we'll take a look at the cases of when it does not work and go like, why doesn't it work? So we'll use a case where it works, okay? So we'll start with something that we have seen already, which is 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 0, 0, 0, 0. You go like, haven't we worked on this one before? Yes, we have worked on this one before, but we did not focus on the sine bit, okay? So I'm just going to go through a really, really fast you know, calculation here because we already know what it should look like from before. Okay. So this is x, y, q, t, d. So we're looking at this one as the sine bit. So using the sine bit alone, um, what can we say about the relationship between the x, v, 
versus y. So if I'm looking at the sine interpretation of x using four bits and looking at you know, the sine bit, excuse me, the sine representation of y using four bits, and I'm saying less than, is that true or false? Okay, so let's flip back to the previous page. Okay, the previous page states, and we concluded this, right? We go through the calculations, and we concluded that d of m minus 1, m is 4 this time, m minus 1 is 3, so d of 3 is a 1, if and only if vs, you know, d of m is less than 0. Okay, and we already know d is less than 0 when x is less than y. Okay, that was established a little bit earlier. So now the question, you know, that was established when we talked about this part here. So now the question is, in our example where, yeah, in our example where the sine bit or D of 3 is indeed a 1, okay, right here, what should be, what should we put here? Is the less than true or false? True. Very good. Okay. So we'll just say, oh, okay, it is true based on what we already know. So we're going to look at another example here. Okay. And let me see. I'm trying to think of a somewhat tricky one. So okay. So we can look at this one. 1000 zero, zero, zero minus, oh, this is going to be good. That would be good. Yep. Okay. So this one, I cannot just kind of, you know, quickly go through it like the previous one because you know, this one that is, is a non-trivial, somewhat non-trivial case. So we have the exclusive or, oops, exclusive or between these two is a one. The exclusive or between these two is a one. Exclusive or between these two is a zero. Exclusive or between these two is also a zero. T0 is assumed as zero in this case. So we have the negation of this and this, which is a one already. So I put a one here. Same thing over here. In order to determine this particular T bit, we look at the negation of this zero and this particular one. It is already a one. Put a one here. Now we, we need to figure out T of three. Somewhat a, a similar situation, except this time we negate this zero and this zero, which is a zero. But then we also have to remember, we have to negate this zero here and then end it with this particular one. Not zero is a one, one and one is a one. And then the, the top part is ORed with the bottom part. So we end up with a one over here. And well, I mean, T of four is really not important in this case, but I will work it out anyway, okay? So we have to figure out what goes here. It is the negation of this and this, which is a zero or the negation of this and this, which is a one. Zero or one is a one, so I put a one over here. Now I have to finish up the entire thing. The exclusive or between the Q and the T, I'll just do it really quickly here because you know, I, should not be, I should not need to spell out all the calculations at this point. Okay, so in this case, it is also a one. Okay, yes, that's, that should work out. So in this case, Vs x4 is less than Vs y4 is also true. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So we'll go ahead and look at one example when it is not true. Okay. So we're looking for a case when the sign bit is not true and it's still within, quote unquote, the normal range. So I'm looking, thinking of a case. Oh, this is a good one. One zero 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 minus zero 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 one. Okay. So with this one, you know, we have one zero zero one SQ. And then for the T's, we have a one here, a one here, and a one here, and then a zero over here. 
and then the exclusive ORs would be 1, 1, 1, and then the 0, okay? So with this one, when we look at the sign flag, it is a 0. So in this case, Vs x4 is less than Vs y4 is false. <clears throat> All right. But I did not tell you what the VSs are, right? You know, so you guys may not be convinced that the conclusion just because of the sign bit makes sense. So we'll go back and well, we can start with this one. So in this case, what is VS x4? You know, this is x and this is y. So what is the sign interpretation of x in this case? Using the VS notation or expanding the VS you know, definition. What is it? Hmm? Negative, eight. negative 8 is correct, okay? So this is negative 8, and <laughs> this side is easy. What is y? What is v as y of 4? One. 1, okay, very good. Uh, negative 8 is less than 1 is true. Does anyone have a... It's false, sorry. Negative 8 is less than 1 is false. Um... It is true, right? You know what? I know why this is. It's okay. So I'm gonna. Okay, I. This is a really interesting example, because now we go like what? Right? Because you know, the sign bit tells you that negative eight is not less than one. But you know that negative 8 is less than 1. What is going on here? Why is the sign flag not being able to indicate the correct result? So we'll flag this one, okay, because this is a special case, and there's a reason why it is special. So how can we make this not special? So to make this not special, we can do it like um, 1, 0, 0, 1, minus... Uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so this one is pretty easy too. Do, 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 do. Like that. And then a bunch of zeros. Like so. And then we just end up with that. Okay, but this time, there's a 1 here. So if you look at the sign flag, then it is concluding that X, uh, Vs x4 is less than Vs y4. Is true okay and then when you look at the actual Vs x4 this is negative 7 and then Vs y4 is still a 1 so you go like what is going on here it works for negative 7 compared to 1 the sign flag correctly tells us the less than is true but when we are using negative 8 versus 1 it gave us the wrong answer okay so there's Something that you need to think about here. We'll, we'll process this later. Okay, and we can also go through some of the earlier examples, okay, because before this we have these examples. So with this one, there's a one here. So that means you know, Vs x4 is less than Vs y4 is true. Does that make sense? Well, since you know, the, sign, the sign bits are both one, they're both zeros here. So that means you know, Vs x4 is really the same thing as Vu, which is 2 in this case. And then Vs y4 is the same as Vu y4, which is a 5 here. 2 is less than 5? Yeah, sure. I mean, that is still true. Not a problem. So we'll take a look at this one here. Okay. So this one is a little bit special because... The overall borrow, or T4, is a 0, meaning that the comparison of the VU is telling us it is false. So now we have to look at the VS comparison, or the sign interpretation comparison. So the one is saying your VS of X4 is less than VS of Y4 is true. So now you have to say, okay, so what are we dealing with here? What is Vs x4 in this case? Vs y4 is easy, it's zero. But what is Vs x4? Hmm? Negative six. Negative six, very good. 
So VSX4 is a negative 6, and then VSY4 is still a 0, and negative 6 is less than 0. That makes sense to me. So now we are looking at this and go like, huh. So there are cases where if you look at it as an unsigned subtraction or unsigned comparison, the answer comes back and say, x is not less than y. The same bit pattern, but using the sign interpretation, the sign bit comes back and say, aha, uh -huh, yeah, x is less than y, if you interpret the bit patterns as signed integers. Okay, so this is one thing you have to really remember. This is a really good case, good example to illustrate that when you're comparing, then it makes sense. Then it matters whether we are using the signed interpretation versus the unsigned interpretation. Yes? Why is it negative six not negative five? Um, well, okay, how do we define the VS notation? The VS notation would add up the powers of two corresponding to the all the all except for the most significant digit, we add up all of those values, right? Mm -hmm. So we have none of one, one of two, none of four. Adds up to what? Two. Okay. Okay. This one indicates that we have to subtract eight from it. So we have two minus eight, which is negative six. Okay. Okay. Yep. By this time, you really have to get the VS definition done. I mean, you really have to have the VU and also the VS definition, not so much memorized, but you really need to know where to find it and apply that. Okay, so don't trust your intuition of, you know, oh, I think the unsigned, in, in, the unsigned value or the signed value is this. Use those definitions to help you figure out the actual value being represented. All right, okay. All right, so, so let's go back to the one that didn't work, okay? Because we want to find out what is going on with that one. So the one that didn't work, I put a star next to it, which is this case over here. It's like, why is it not working? Well, to understand why this is not working, we look at negative eight minus one, okay? And what is that? Negative nine, right? Okay, negative nine. What is so special about negative nine? So this relates to question number seven, if I remember correctly. This relates to question number seven in your practice exam, in the exam from last from the last semester. What did that one ask you? What is one of the things that you have to figure out for that particular question? What is the range of values that can be represented as a signed integer? given an X number of bits, okay? So let's, let's not even look up that definition, okay? So what we'll do is we are just going to spell out, okay, the signed interpreted value right here. So the VS of D4, okay, I think we have done this already, but we'll do it over here again. <clears throat> this is D0 times 1 plus D1 times 2 plus D2 times 4, minus d3 times 8, okay? We have seen this already. This is the second time I expand vsd4 in this class. So if I were to ask you and ask, what is the most negative value that I can represent using this particular expression when d of something can only be a 0 or 1? What would be your answer? Negative 8. Negative 8. So if D0, D1, D2 are all zeros, and then D3 is a 1, then it, they, the expression would be negative 8. You cannot go below negative 8. Does that make sense? Well, can someone tell me what is, where, where do we put negative 9? It is just one beyond what we can represent. So that is telling us that, hmm, so if the, actual result of the subtraction is out of the range of what we can represent, then the sign flag is no longer telling us the correct answer. Okay, so it's just an observation. I'm not proving it right now. I'm just making an observation. This is the one time that the sign flag 
does not tell us the proper answer because negative eight is less than one, but the sine flag tells us otherwise. But at the same time, this is also the case where the actual difference is out of the range of what we can represent using only four bits. Yes? Um, would that hold true for other like bits as well? Like if you have a five bit addition yes. and subtraction and the number could only yep. be represented via six, it would be the same value? Yep. So, but this is not the only one, you know, the only case where we are out of your know, bits to represent the result. So I'll present to you another case where it's like, oh, okay, it's similar, but not exactly the same. So I use um, this one, which is one, zero, one, 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 minus mm, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, okay? No, I take it back. I take it back, sorry. <clears throat> one, 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 zero. There we go. Okay, so we go through the subtraction thing. Okay, this is a really good practice here you know, for all of us. Yeah, you know, with binary subtraction, we put a one here, zero, zero, a one over here. We assume a zero for t zero because you know in this case we are not trying to backfill fill all the. We are not treating t zero as an input, so it has a default value of zero. So we could put a zero here, put zero here, put a zero here, put a one over here. Yeah, that looks right to me. Put a one here, zero, zero, and a one over here. Okay. So in this case, it, looking at only this flag here, it is to, it seems to be telling us that Vs um, x4 is less than Vs y4 is true. Right? Because you know, the sign flag is supposed to tell us. The sign flag is a one if and only if x is less than y. In the signed interpretation. So that would be what it seems to be telling me. Can someone tell me what is VSX4 in this case? 1 plus 2 plus 4 without the minus 8 is 7. Very good. And can someone tell me what is VSY4? So in this case we have no 1, we have 2 plus 4 which is a 6 minus 8. It's negative two. Very good. What? The sign flag lied again. Seven is less than negative two is true? No, it is not true. So now we have to actually do the math, right? So tell me what is seven minus negative two? Just do your usual arithmetic. It's nine. Okay. So now, so now the question is, is nine beyond the range of what we can represent using only four bits and using the signed interpretation. So I'm going to repeat that statement again. D0 times 1 plus D1 times 2 plus D2 times 4 minus D3 times 8. So how do you maximize and make it the most positive value possible when you have only control over D0, D1, D2, and D3, and they can only be, each one can only be a 0 or 1. So what can be the maximum? value coming out of this expression. Hmm? Seven. Seven is correct, okay? Because you know, the, the best you can do is to have D0, D1, D2 all being ones, and then D3 being a zero. That's the best you can do. So that means this whole thing, they, it has to be less than or equal to seven on one side. It has to be greater than or equal to negative eight on the other side. We talked about this already, just in a slightly different way when we when I explained the answer to question number seven on Tuesday. Okay, this is just a really, really spelled out example to illustrate exactly the same thing. Where's nine? Nine is not within this range. So once again, the result of the subtraction is out of the range of what we can represent using the sign interpretation. So do you think this is coincidental? Every single time the difference is out of range, the sign bit is no longer telling us the correct result in terms of the comparison. Do you think it is coincidental? It is not coincidental, okay? So that means, oh, so now we have a way to figure out the actual relationship. We just have to take into consideration whether we have a situation where it is out of range. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So how do we tell that the difference is out of range relative to the two numbers that we are subtracting? So that becomes the next question. How do we detect that we have a result, which is the difference, that is out of range? Okay. All right, so to answer that question, I will ask you in this case, what is, uh, oops, in this case, what is Vs of 1, 0, 0, 1, which is our D, for? We have 1 plus 0 plus 0 minus 8. 1 minus 8 is negative 7. Okay? Okay. I think we have a really big problem here because 7, which is a non-negative value, minus a negative value should always end up with a non-negative value. Does that make sense? And yet, we end up with something. Not only is it wrong, it's on the wrong side of 0. The side itself is wrong. Right? Okay? So let's go back to the other example where it also did not work out correctly. So we'll take a look at this one. So in this case, what is Vs of 0, 1, 1, 1, 4? That's an easy one. Oh, I thought you had 7. That's right. Okay. So you look at this particular example, it's the same thing. It does not make sense. It really does not make sense. Because negative 8 minus 1 should have been negative 9, right? But the subtractor gave me 7 instead. So not only is the answer wrong, it is on the wrong side of the 0. Is that okay? So that means whenever it would seem to me that whenever the sign of the difference is incorrect, it is telling us that we are out of range. Is that okay? So now the question is, how can we tell that the sign of the difference is on the wrong side? relative to x and y. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at the truth table because the truth table will help us derive the actual equation later on. So we are looking at the sine flag of x. So using our specific example, we'll be looking at x of 3 and then we'll look at y of 3. So these are the two sine flags of x and y you know, respectively. And then we'll take a look at d of 3, okay? We'll treat all of these as quote-unquote independent variables, which means you know, one can be a zero, the other one can be a one, and they don't give, affect each other. So now we have a table that has eight entries. Okay. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, and then we have one, one, one. Okay, that's the entire table. So now we want to see whether we have a overflow situation. In other words, the sign of the difference makes no sense. Okay? All right. What does it mean when the most significant bit is a zero in terms of the value being represented? The value is non-negative. Okay, very good. Okay, I, I have to be a little nitpicky here because the zero is neither positive or ne nor negative, so I have to say it is non-negative. But you're correct. Okay, so on the first row, okay, I'm going to point out the first row here. So on the first row, we are basically saying the middle end is non-negative, the subtract hand is non-negative, and x minus y is non-negative. Can that happen? Sure. 2 minus 1 is 1. They're all non-negative. Okay? Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay? So that means, you know, yeah, there's no overflow here. Okay? The, the sign makes sense. The sign of the difference makes sense. What about the next one? Okay? We move on to the next one. You have a non-negative minuan, a non-negative subtrahend, but the difference is negative. Can that happen? Yeah. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, okay? So it can happen. It's not an overflow. And then we look at this one here. 
we have a non-negative minivan, a negative subtrahend, and the result is um, non-negative. That is supposed to happen, right? Because you have one minus negative one is a two. So, okay, there's no overflow here. What about the next one? You have the same kind of situation, but you know, the difference is negative. So let me describe the situation again. The minivan x is non-negative. The subtract hand, which is y, is negative. But the difference is negative as well. Does that make sense to you? You should be turning your head because it does not make sense, okay? Because what we are looking at here is something that's positive or non-negative minus something that is negative, and it ends up with something that is negative. That does not happen, okay, because that it doesn't make sense. So that means, yeah, if this is what we're observing, then we have an overflow situation. We have seen this one already. One of the cases where it did not work falls into this case. Okay, so if you're not convinced, we are going to go back to look at that one. I think it's this one right here. Do you see how the sine flag of x is a 0, the sine flag of y is a 1, and the sine flag of the difference is also a 1? And this is the one, this is one of the two cases that we have gone through where the result does not make sense, quote unquote, does not make sense. Okay? So that's an example. So we go back to the truth table, we'll finish it up. So the, the, uh, the next row, which is this one here, we start with a negative value, we subtract a non-negative value from the negative value, and we end up with something that is non-negative. Can that happen? Pluck in some numbers, okay? Figure out whether it makes sense or not. You start with negative 2. You subtract 1 from it, and then somehow you end up with something that is not negative. Does that make sense to you? No, it does not make sense. So this is the other overflow situation. We put a 1 here. But we have an example for this one as well, okay? So I want to show you the example. So this way you can tie in, you know, the concept with very specific example. The starred example here is that case. X in this case is representing negative 8, Y in this case is representing 1, and yet the sign of the difference is a 0. Because the sign, I mean the difference, is actually representing 7. Does that make sense to you? Negative 8 minus 1 is 7? No. The sign itself is wrong already. So this is the, this is the specific example corresponding to Oops. Corresponding to the fifth row, which is this one here. Okay, so this row is you know is also a case of overflow. Now, without going through all the details, I will just tell you the answer of the following three rows. They're all zeros. They they all make sense, okay, and that's why they're not overflow situations. So looking at this table, it looks like we have a systematic way to figure out whether there's an overflow situation or not, right? Because it looks like you know, we can rely on just the sign flag of the minimum end, the sign flag of the subtract hand, and the sign flag of the difference when it, this particular pattern happens, or when this particular pattern happens, then we have an overflow situation. So are we, are we okay with that claim? So now the question is, uh, we like to express everything in logic gates, okay, in a circuit, or you know, I can also say we want to express everything as logical Boolean expressions. So now the question is, can I come up with a Boolean expression such that the Boolean expression will give me exactly these particular values? Hmm. Well, it shouldn't be too hard, okay? Because in this case, we just have to focus on the two rows where they give they gave us once. This is one row. So how do I come up with an expression that is true only for this particular row here? Uh, not x3, y3, e3? Yep, okay. So in this specific case, you know, then we have 
the negation of x3 because they will turn the 0 into a 1 and y3 and d3. So these are ended together, okay? What about the next row? What about the next row, which is this row over here? How can I come up with an expression that is true but only for this row and not for any other row? Go ahead. Uh, x, <laughs> x not, not y, not b, and it's good. Like that? Yep, OK. But wait, tack, you know, I thought we wanted you know, uh, the overall you know, to be one you know, whether we are, when we are on one of these two rows. So how do we do that? Or them together, right? This is a dot. So overflow is defined that way. So you might say, okay, we have just worked out you know, for four bits when m equals to four, this is what happens. What about we have m bits? What, what, what are we gonna do? In other words, you know, what, what if we are not dealing with four bit numbers, we're dealing with m bit numbers? Yep. M minus one plus three. Change all the threes to m minus one. Yep, that's it. That's your overflow. So overflow in general is the negation. I mean, you can do it in either order. Okay, so x of m minus 1 and y of m minus 1 and d of m minus 1 or x of m minus 1 and the negation of y of m minus 1 and the negation of d of m minus 1. It is a mouthful to say but the concept is not really hard. The concept is really just saying, if the sign of the difference doesn't make sense, we have an overflow, we have an overflow situation. All right, so are we doing okay so far with all of this stuff here? I will take road you know, in the last 10 minutes or so, so, but are we still doing okay so far with the derivation? So this is how overflow is defined. So what do we have so far? We have the sign flag, which is really just you know, a D of M minus 1. That's our sign flag. So what is our situation? Our situation, there are four different scenarios. D of M minus 1, overflow. This can be 0. This can be 1. This can be 0 or 1. This can be 0 or 1. And we want to see whether V as X4 uh, M, sorry, is less than b as y m over here. Okay, so now we have a new truth table that we need to work out. In other words, if my d, if the sign flag of the difference is a zero and there's no overflow, do we end up with um, the sign value of x being less than the sign value of y? No, well, the answer is no. Okay, because the overflow flag is saying can we trust the sign flag? If the overflow is a one, it's saying, oh, don't trust the sign flag, the sign flag is lying. Is that okay? But what if the overflow is a zero? Well, that means, yeah, go ahead and trust the, the sign flag. The sign flag is a one if and only if x is less than one. Okay? So in the next one, okay, what happens here? This is basically saying the sign flag tells us, no, x is not less than y, and then the overflow flag <laughs> the sign flag is lying. So the question is, what is the truth? Is x less than y? Okay, let me repeat that question. This is one of those you know, logic puzzle thing that you get in philosophy classes. So the second row corresponds to, the sign flag says, x is not less than y. The overflow flag, the overflow flag says, don't trust the sign flag, the sign flag is lying. So the question is, is x less than y? Yes. It is, okay? Because the sign flag is lying when it says it is not. So it has to be. Okay. Oh, how did I get there? Um, I have to get out of that. Get out of that. Okay. All right. All right. What about the next one? The third row says... The sign flag says, yes, x is less than y, 
the overflow said the overflow flag says the sign flag is not lying. So what is the reality? Is x less than y? Yes. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> what about the last one? The sign flag says x is less than y. The overflow flag says the sign flag is lying. So what is the reality? Is x less than y? Nope. There we go. Okay. Wow. Okay. So we are now at the end of this entire thing. So I'm going to call this whole thing the L flag, just because I'm so tired of writing V S X M is less than V S Y M. Okay. So I just I'll just call this L. So how would you define L? In terms of d of n minus one, which is the sign flag, and the overflow flag. Hmm? Or, or well, if it was an or, this would have been a one two, which is not what we want. Exclusive or. Okay, very good. Okay, so for those of you who looked at this and go like, I think we have seen this many times already. This is just exclusive or. Yep, it really is just exclusive or. So L, which is a flag that I call less than, okay, that's why, that's why it's called L, is D of M exclusive or with the overflow flag. So now you have everything that you need for the lab today. Okay. So the next question is, can we do all of this stuff here using logic gates? In other words, if I go ahead and implement the borrow, look ahead, your subtractor. Can I just change the circuit, add something to it to get to the L flag and also the overflow flag? The sign flag is free because we have that already. It's just the most significant bit of the difference. So the question is, can I do this all in, you know, in Logisim? The answer is, yeah, easy peasy. Because the overflow flag is just, you know, okay, I'm going to use my finger here. It's just one AND gate ending these three things together, another AND gate ending these three things together, and then a single OR gate to OR the output of the two AND gates. That's our overflow. Once you get the overflow, then you just need an exclusive OR gate here to exclusive OR the overflow, which we just mentioned earlier, with the uh, most significant bit of the difference, which is already in the subtractor. So that means, oh yeah, all of these things are easily computable, you know, using logic set. Because I really want to double check, okay? Every time I introduce something, I want to make sure that it can be done um, using just logic gates. All right, so with all of this done and said, let's go ahead and take roll. And I have to change the time because I think uh, I did not provide sufficient time for people to participate. So I'm going to have to change that a little bit here. All right, so today is the 21st. And the word is overflow. But I think I need to change the time. Yep, I need to change the time. So give me a second here. I'll change it to 1020. That should be plenty. 10.20 a.m. 10.28 a.m. There we go. So you should be able to get into the role-taking activity and tell me that you're here. Access code is just overflow. There we go. All lower case. All right. So in previous semesters, you know, I usually cover this topic before exam two, but this semester, you know, we are going to have exam two, excluding the binary comparison topic. So that that's why you know some of the questions are no longer applicable in the exam one from 2023 because you know that those some of those involve the, the flags too which does not mean that you know you should just gonna like oh we'll just ignore those questions you can if you want to but 
it might actually be helpful if you try to answer some of those questions too. Now that we understand what is the L flag and what is the overflow flag, you can try to answer all of the five first five questions. Since we have uh, 10 minutes left, do you guys want me to kind of go over some of those? Yes? Why not? Right? Okay. So we'll go ahead and do that. So once again, I have to emphasize the flags on the overflow and the L flags are not going to be in your exam one. Okay, just want to make sure everybody understand that. All right, so we are looking at, oh, it's already up here. All right, so out of these, you know, you guys can pick one. I mean, pick one of uh, questions one, two, three, or four, because they all involve the overflow flag. <laughs> Just pick one. Yeah, it doesn't matter which one. Hmm? Number four? Okay. So we'll start with number four. Okay, number four. So I'm going to write down the question on my tablet, and then we'll switch to the tablet to talk about the solution. So now we have y0 is a 1, x0 is a 0, and then the overflow is also a 0. And put that all the way over there. So there we go. Okay. So switch back to here. Okay. All right. So how do we figure this one out? As it turns out, the overflow flag is very informed. Okay. It tells you a lot of things because of that. Because it involves a lot of bits. So that means you know, whether it's a zero or one, either way, it tells you a lot of things. So we're going to start with that one. So the well, in fact. We can only start with that one, right? So the overflow flag is, okay, in this case, because it's a one-bit subtractor, x0, y0, and d0, they're all the sign bits already, okay, because there, there are only one bits for each of those numbers. So the overflow is now defined to be x0, not y0, not d0, or not x0, y0, d0, okay? And we know this is given to be a zero. All right, so using the constraint-based reasoning, okay, are we limiting ourselves to only certain combinations of the three bits? The answer is yes, because when the result of a or is a zero, it means both sides of the disjunction, they both have to be zeros. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna use a very mathematical notation here. This implies that x0, not y0, uh, not d0, has to be a 0. And we also know that not x0, y0, d0 also has to be a 0. Okay? That's an immediate result of knowing that overflow is a 0. Okay, well, that's uh, somewhat useful. But we also know what is x0 and y0. Okay? So, so I'll call this, you know, I'll label this as A, okay? So, well, actually I have, this is, okay, let me, let me correct this a little bit. I'm going to change the labeling a little bit. This is A and this is B because they are two separate assertions. So you look at what is given to you, which is, you know, we know what is Y and we know what is X already. So given our X and Y, okay, so I'm going to say here, given y0 is a 1, and x0 is a 0. Which one has to be false anyway? It's none of my concern at this point. Which one of a or b has to be a 0 just because I know x0 is a 0 and y0 is a 1? That is correct. So a has to be a 0, okay? So this implies a is zero already. I don't need to know what is D, okay? Because if you just plug in X zero being a zero into here, that alone is telling you well, that part of you know, the overflow equation has to be a zero. What about the other side, okay? So this also implies in order for B to be a zero, 
what do we need? Let's take a look at B. So B, which is representing this one here, it says the negation of x is 0. Since x is 0 is a 0, the negation of that is a 1. And y0, y0 is known to be 1. So now at this point, we have 1 and 1. So whether B is true or not hinges on one thing. What is that one thing? D0. So if D0 is a 1, the whole thing is going to be true. But we know we don't want that, right? Because we, we know overflow is a 0. So, so in order for B to be a 0, we can now conclude that D0 has to be Because if it was a 1, then we would end up with overflow being a 1. But since overflow is given to us as a 0, so that means D0 has to be? Yeah, D0 has to be 0. It has to be 0. Okay, so we have one conclusion now. D0 is a 0. So what do we have now? We know what is overflow. Great. We know what is X0. We know what is Y0. I think we can figure out the rest. Okay, so we now can say, you know, Q0 is X0 exclusive or with y0, which is easy to compute because that's just a 0 exclusive or with 1, which is a 1. So the question is, what is t0? <laughs> well, we can't figure that out directly, but we can figure it out by knowing what is d0 already. So now we can say, hmm, knowing q0 is a 1, and we know that uh, d0 is a 0, that implies uh, t of 0 has to be what? d of 0 is q0 exclusive or with t0, and we know that d0 is a 0. So, so t0 has to be? Zero. One. One. It has to be a 1. Uh-huh, yep. OK, cool. Now we can figure out what is t of 1, because t of 1 is not x0, y0, or not q0, t0. Since we know x, y, q, t already, so it's just plugging everything here. So we have uh, not 0 and 1. OK, that's a 1 already. I mean, the other part is not important, because we have a borrow just by looking at 0 minus y. You know, I mean, excuse me, x minus y, because x0 is a 0, y0 is a 1. That subtraction alone is going to give us t1 being a 1. I don't, I don't even need to look at what is q0 and t0. Is that okay? So this is how we resolve every single bit. Okay, so in this case, what is L? And how is L defined? L is the most significant bit of D, which is D0 in this case, because D only has one digit, exclusive or with overflow. Since D0 is a 0, the overflow is also a 0, the L flag is a 0. So this way we basically figure out every single bit. So L is a 0, um, T1 is a 1. Uh, Q0 is a 1. Uh, D0 is a 0. Yeah, so I think we got every single bit now. All right, and we are right on time you know, for the end of the lecture. Do we have any questions? The question is not so much about, you know, do we just kind of memorize all of these steps, okay? Don't do that, okay? That's not usually useful. It's about the approach. Okay, start with what is given to you, connect it with the definition of that one thing, apply that, and then ask, okay, if we know this expression is a 1 or this expression is a 0, what is that telling me? Okay, if an or, if the result of an or is a 0, you should go like, yay, because that really helps to restrict, because both sides of the or, they both have to be zeros. If the end is a 1, you should also say, yay, because both sides of the end should also be 1s, which means it is the most restrictive case given that particular operator. 
So once you have figured out all of those constraints, then you combine those constraints and ask yourself, how can I make this happen? Given these are the constraints, what are the remaining possibilities? And then you start to rule out the possibilities. Okay, so those are the techniques you know, to answer the questions. I try my best to explain you know, my approach. I'm not sure whether that works or not, because I have been told that you know I can explain my approach you know, until my face turns blue, and then some people you know say that you know, they still don't understand what I'm talking about. But I'm really trying my best. Okay, it's not easy to um, figure out how you think. Okay, you guys can give it a try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you know you solve a problem, okay, you, you just intuitively you know, solve a problem. They're like, oh, the answer is blah blah blah. Can you show me how you reason that through? It's like, <laughs> I'll get back to you, <laughs> because it's not easy to kind of step out of yourself and look at your own thought process and be able to remember how you go through the thought process, because especially when most of that is subconscious. Alrighty, so we are done with the lecture. Do we have any additional questions before I turn off the recorder? This is all being recorded, as far as I know. Let's make sure. It's too late to really do anything about it if I did not. Okay, but it's all recording, so, so it's all good. Yep. Uh, not with the other four questions. So I can I can post that to you. Um, so remember, the flags are not on your exam one, so just remember that. Um, okay, so what we'll do is we are going to switch to the lab. All right, so we do have a lab today, and it's on the overflow flag and the L flags and stuff like that. So and it's all the way down here. It's called uh, Subtraction and Compare. And there's a passcode or access code to it. The access code is flags, all lowercase flags. And now that I publish it, you should be able to see it now. I'm just double checking to make sure that you have the correct time you know, for the due date. Yep, so those are all good. All right. So you should be able to access, you know, subtraction and compare now, and you have until uh, eleven fifty to finish your lab. Oh, uh, flags, lowercase. I'll write it on the whiteboard, and then I'll turn off the screen. Yeah. 